today's pres presenter is Donald R. Hoffman, PhD, Professor in Pathology and Laboratory Medicine. And here is Dr. Hoffman to speak on histopathology in the 19th century, Verkhoff to frozen sections. Okay, I used 19th century in my title, but I'm going to actually go up to 1905. So, uh, because I'm going to talk about other people's historical inaccuracies. And everybody knows the classic example that's happened recently of the state of Virginia taking a bunch of internet references about African-American soldiers serving in the Confederate Army willingly, which, of course, if you go back to the real primary sources, isn't true. But we're going to, when we talk about Verkhoff, we're going to run into some similar types of legends, many of them quoted by famous historians of science without paying any attention to whether they're plausible or not. Okay, this is a portrait of Rudolf Ludwig Karl Virchow, and I'm going to spend a good part of the beginning talking about Virchow. Virchow actually was so important that he was the most well-known physician from the late 1850s uh, through about 1900. You could show people who were well-read and read some of the magazines and newspapers of the time a picture, and they would immediately recognize him. He was probably the most famous. Uh, physician uh, of his time. And his contributions to many areas uh, are still with us. He was born October 13th in 1821. Actually, he was of Polish descent. Died September 5th, 1902, after a streetcar accident. He was a pathologist, anthropologist, biologist, public health activist, politician. And he worked, his first professorship was in Würzburg, but uh, some of his public health and politics uh, were not very popular at the time, and he got booted out. And then eventually, he became so well known that they gave him the chair uh, in Berlin. Okay, some of his major accomplishments are, Virchow was the one who said that a cell comes from a cell. He was the first one who thought that the origin of disease has to do with the cell and not with just changes in humors and the kinds of things that people thought at the time. And he started a project of describing what the cellular appearance of multiple diseases were and also trying to look at how they developed with time. So he was the first one to extensively use the microscope. There was one famous story before him of Dr. Paget, who is a famous pathologist who there are several diseases named from, was at a medical, as a medical student or resident doing an autopsy, and the patient had died from trichinosis, and he took some of the muscle, and he was trying to find a microscope to look and see what the sandy granules were in the muscle. And the only microscope he could find was from one of the <coughs> botanists. And he, he was the first one to describe uh, the trichinella. And then what happened is after he did this, he went and he showed it to his professor, who stole the whole thing and published it without Paget. So scientific misconduct in the early 19th century. OK, so among the other things that Virchow said, he first described leukemia, that was cancer of the white blood cells, thromboembolism, clots blocking circulation and causing tissue to die very important in Germany in recognizing the importance of sanitation. He thought that a lot of disease and the epidemics in a lot of areas were caused by, spread by water, sewage, and things that weren't clean, although he didn't understand or believe in the bacterial theory of infectious disease at the time. He also recognized that animals had many diseases similar to people, and we'll mention one case later where he actually used a dog to trace, trace a human disease. And he was the founder of comparative pathology, very active in physical anthropology. The famous anthropologist Franz Boas was one of his students. And social medicine, he recognized that there are aspects of medicine that shouldn't be approached just by an individual patient, but public health and society and sanitation. So. It, very, very important individual. 
Among the people he trained are Klebs, who we'll mention, the famous pathologists Kohnheim and Hopzeiler, whose name used to be on a journal, the neuropathologist von Recklinghausen, and Franz Boas, the anthropologist. Now, Virchow, again, did not believe in the, with Lister and, some of, and Holmes and some of the other people who were, at that time, espousing the germ theory of disease. And he didn't believe that you could kill, prevent infectious disease by using antiseptics. Uh, but later, when the evidence became clear, later in the century, he did turn to believe it. He didn't believe in Darwin's theory of evolution because he could not, at that time, there were not any known fossils that were between an ape and a human. And we know now from Africa there are lots of them, and some from Asia also. But uh, he undoubtedly would have changed his theory and his posturing had he seen those fossils. He was a very strident politician. He was uh, very loud and uh, outspoken, and he spoke his mind at all times. He belonged to the Liberal Party. At that time, Germany was ruled by, I'm not sure what it was called, but it was the Conservative Party, uh, Otto von Bismarck. And he got in a substantial verbal argument with von Bismarck, and von Bismarck challenged him to a duel. And here's where we run into some very interesting history. You can go and look, and you'll find even in very reliable places by very reliable authors, like the New York Times by one of their science writers, stories about how this duel happened. Now, obviously, Virchow was not going to fight with Bismarck with pistols or knives or swords. So uh, since Bismarck challenged him, it was Virchow's choice to pick the weapon. So Virchow chose sausages. Now, here's where the story <laughs> varies all over the place. Now, some people say that what Virchow did is that he took one of the sausages and infected it uh, with cholera or some organism. Since he didn't believe in the germ theory of disease, and since he was a physician and he was an extremely moral and upright individual, it's extremely improbable that he would do that. Then, and there's various versions of that. And that's the one that's actually most predominant in at least the English literature. Then there's another one that says that he intentionally put trichinella in the sausage. Uh, this is also extremely improbable because he just wouldn't do it. What he actually did is it was very common at that time to eat a very lightly smoked sausage in Germany. There was a very high chance that this had trichinella in it and that that was what he used. So it was something that von Bismarck would have eaten anyhow or might have eaten anyhow. Uh, he did not die from it, uh, but the story got sort of a, And there's just incredible historical inaction. You have to actually look back in the German literature and it, it just says that he gave him sausage and it was that particular kind of which I forget the name. Uh, and the way, one of Virchow's key experiments with trichinella was that he saw the cysts in the sandy field in a human autopsy. And what he did is he fed some of the human muscle to a dog, and the dog developed trichinosis. So it's just like a Koch's postulate type experiment, but earlier. And so, so, so that's the scientific origin of where the dual story came from. I mean, but also remind you that even in the history of science, be very careful what you, whose word you take for what. Uh, he married Rose Mayer and had, some, had children. She was the daughter of sort of the founder of obstetrics and gynecology. So this is a very medically oriented family. Uh, he is so famous. This is a, the sort of citizen of the week from Punch as done by the famous caricature Spy that was published right after in the 1860s. And again, everybody would have immediately recognized him. This is Virchow's original microscope. It's not in terribly good condition. It's in the Charité Hospital uh, in Berlin. All his slides and his specimen collection survived. Uh, the specimen collection is mainly still there in Berlin. The slides were almost all destroyed, although not by a direct hit, by damage from percussion in the bombing during World War II. So there's only a few slides left, and the curators there don't allow anybody to look at them or touch them. So they're just in a, in a glass exhibit case. But all of his original slides uh, did exist until 
World War II. Uh, this is a little better conditioned version of his microscope. This one is in the collection here. It's not currently on exhibit, uh, made by Hartnack in Paris. And he went with his wife to special trip to buy one of these microscopes. Uh, before I learned how to do it a little bit better, I took some pictures through that microscope. It's very difficult with these friction spiral focusing microscopes to keep them in focus at high power when you try to take a picture through them. But here's the low power, an attempt at high power. Here's a high power actually of a piece of, of a flea, which is uh, a little bit better. So you can get a pretty decent image. So he spent hours and hours. Remember, there were no electric lights. So he, these had to be lit by the daylight or by a lamp, uh, usually an oil lamp. Uh, Virchow first published his lectures from uh, 1858, which he gave in London, as a book called Cellular Pathology in German. This is the translation of the, for, of the English edition of the second. This book was so important that in 1859, they issued a revised and amended version that was much longer, and it is the famous book. And there are German and English copies on Google digitized books. If anybody is interested in them, you can download them. There's also a copy of the German one here. I don't know if you have the English one. I don't remember. And, there's, and I have a copy of the German one. Uh, the book was translated into essentially every important European language by 1860 and published. I mean, is that influential? And there was an American edition uh, also beside the English one. Uh, this is a page for it. Uh, most of the book deals with infectious disease, metabolic disease, and thromboembolism. Uh, they didn't really understand much about cancer at the time. And it was very interesting that Virchow took his theory, which is on this page, of the development of cancer and made it parallel to what he saw as the development of an infectious disease. Uh, what he's talking about here has heteroplasms, goes to a cancroid, stages, the sarcoma exhibits stages of development. Some of it's sort of true, but a lot of it, it's mainly just based upon observations with an infectious disease. Uh, there's only a couple of pages in that entire about 500 page book about cancer, which is as different, <coughs> different from pathology in the 20th century. Okay, now he did all this, and I'm just, just a list because we're going to talk about when some of these things came in. Didn't have any of these things. Didn't have fixation with formalin. They fixed things with alcohol or with acids. They didn't have embedding. One of his students invented that didn't have tissue processing, so the tissues weren't dried and preserved. They didn't have a rotary microtome. You could not cut thin sections. They didn't have frozen sections because you couldn't freeze anything except with ice and salt or if you were lucky out there in the winter. And that was slow, so it caused a lot of damage. They did not know that you could use synthetic dyes. These were starting to be made by the German chemical companies, but they weren't in use. They didn't have purified hematoxylin. What they had is just an extract of the tree bark, which we'll talk about. They hadn't discovered mordants to fix them and make the colors permanent. And they didn't know histochemistry that you could make chemical reactions uh, in the tissues. So he did. And how did he go about making all those pictures? They also didn't have photography, and particularly photography through a microscope. They used a camera lucida. This is one from the later 19th century by Zeiss. Uh, and what you do is you look through, and you can see, as you look through the microscope, the image of the paper underneath that's right beside it. And so what you do is you draw, like you're tracing, the image in the microscope on the piece of paper. And he sat there and did this for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of specimens. And he did this himself. I mean, students did it, but he didn't use theirs. And then the way they would make the illustration in the book is they would take his picture and somebody would, would make a woodcut uh, to print in the book. And this is a camera lucida that's set up for looking at a gross specimen. Again, <coughs> this is the little part where you look down at the paper through here and you, so you see the image that's through the low power dissecting microscope and you see your paper.
how did he cut his sections? Well, he did have some microtomes, and I'll show you some, but he didn't. Most of the pathologists didn't prefer them. And the microtomes worked pretty well for plant materials, but they didn't work very well for human and animal materials. Again, because they weren't hardened. So what they used is, this is a knife that has two blades that are close together that you control the distance by the screw here, called a Valentine's knife. And some of the pathologists, and many times their wives were really the experts at doing this, and their wives would actually cut the sections. And so they would try to cut a section with this. So you didn't have like a 10 micron section. You'd be lucky if you'd get a 50 micron section, and it wouldn't be even. And we show you some photographs of slides. You, you'll see unevenness. But they did all this with these Valentine knives. It was quite an art. Uh, the first example I can find of somebody actually doing photomicrography is an American, Colonel Joseph Woodward. And I guess when we have our Civil War medicine exhibit, he'll be very important because he was one of the authors of the book of medicine in the Civil War. And Colonel Woodward had a Zetmayer microscope, and he used the sun and this giant camera setup to take pictures in 1867. And that's one of the earliest examples of somebody taking a photograph through a microscope. It didn't improve that much in the 19th century. This is in 1904. Uh, two other important people, 1870, Jules Girardin used the first enclosed camera like this. Uh, he's, here they're using a big, like I don't know what size it is, 11 by 14 or something like that plate. And an arc lamp here to get enough light. And the first book that showed photomicrographs was published in 1877 by Robert Bell. OK, now we'll look at some of the technical developments. Hematoxylin stain comes from the Hematoxylin campichianum, a Central American tree, which was brought to Europe about 1520. They take the bark or the wood and extract the dye in water. Robert Hooke first used it in the 1660s, so it's about the first stain that was used. Uh, Quecket, who was one of the founders of microscopy, used it in 1848 to stain uh, various types of plants and other specimens. Uh, its use in mammalian tissue didn't really become important until Beamer in 1865 found that if you treat it with a mordant like alum, that you differentiated the color and fixed it much better. So you don't get the blue color until you have the mordant. Uh, in 1881, Raynaud in France, in a very short paper, described the combination of hematoxylin with a mordant and eosin, and he ended up with something comparable to this modern skin section with the pink cells and the blue nuclei. So the blue stains the acid components and the pink the basic components of the cell. And we still use it. And now, like in the hospital laboratory, it's all done by machine, so it's very, very reproducible. Okay, Paul Ehrlich, and here he's shown on a 200 mark note. And here's his microscope, which is a Zeiss microscope. And Ehrlich was important both in pathology, uh, he's also the founder founding father of immunology, and in the chemistry of dyes. Ehrlich, in 1877, published the first description of a cell that the granules bound the red dye, eosin. Eosin is, an, is a, an aniline dye manufactured. Uh, he also looked at other aniline dyes, fuchsin, methyl violet, Safran and others, all of which are still used. Uh, he published a whole encyclopedia on staining in the blood in 1891, and he edited a, a very large two-volume set on microscopic technique, which documents almost every technique that was in use in the late 19th century. Uh, this is Ehrlich's paper on eosin and the eosinophil, and this was published before he got his doctorate degree in 1877. You notice these are the old days, there was no co-authors. The professor didn't put his name on it. And then this is 
the front page of the first volume of his book on histology and staining in the blood, a very large two-volume set, published in 1891. Okay, bacterial staining wasn't really discovered until 1884. Hans Christian Graham, we still use his method, the Graham stain. Uh, we get gram positive or blue and gram negative or red. Uh, he used the Siebert number four microscope. This is one that I have that's, I haven't brought over here yet and exhibited, but it'll, it's in the collection here. Uh, Siebert microscopes are particularly in demand for people who want to do photography. They liked them better than the lights or the Zeiss at the time. Uh, this is the English translation of the beginning of Graham's paper. It was only four pages long. They didn't call them bacteria at that time. They called them schizomycetes. Didn't put his first name on either. He was actually not working in Germany. He was a Dutchman, but he, I mean a Danish. He was Danish, but he was working in Germany at the time because he, he went to Berlin. Okay, show you some slides. This is a ringing table. You'll see in, when I show you some pictures of 19th century slides, a lot of them are ringed. They're usually made with balsam as the mounting medium. Sometimes they'll have liquid actually in them. That'll be sealed in them. And they can have either just sealing rings or decorative rings. So this tends to keep them away from the air. If they're kept out of the light, a lot of them uh, don't bleach and they're still readily visible. And we'll be looking at a series of microscopic pictures. These are some of the ones that we'll actually be looking at. Here you can see the decorative rings. Uh, some of these are particularly good because they're dated, or some of them they'll stay, how they're stained or where they came from. And the more documentation, of course, the more valuable they are for history. It doesn't do you too much good if the slide says uh, lung carcinoma and nothing else, because you don't know when, where, what, because it could be from any time. Uh, but a lot of these, you see these are dated. These are, a lot of slides that you find are actually cut by medical and veterinary students because in the old days, not only did you have to look at slides, which we don't do anymore with our medical students, but you had to cut them and prepare them yourself too. So that somewhat limits the quality of some of them. Uh, here's some from University College of Liverpool, uh, Columbia University. Uh, these are, these three here are made by professional mounters. And this one by a doctor who is collecting exotic diseases, who luckily has almost complete documentation on the label. Okay, paraffin embedding was invented by the pathologist and bacteriologist Edwin Klebs, who was a student of Virchow. He developed it in the 1860s while he was working with Virchow in Berlin, but he didn't really perfect it for a little while. And so he published it in 1869 while he was professor at the University of Bern in Switzerland. Uh, Klebs was a really nasty guy, just like the organism that's named from Klebsiella, which causes pneumonia, particularly in alcoholics. Had a mercurial temper temperament. During his career, he had 12 positions at 10 institutions, so places got fed up with him pretty quickly. <laughs> he has this picture. And here's his original paper uh, in German where he's describing the embedding. And he figured out that you could dehydrate the tissue and then transfer it into xylene and then in infiltrate it with paraffin and embed it in a block of paraffin. And this finally allowed people to be able to, to section. Okay, now here's two early types of microtome. This is a screw or Stirling microtome. Uh, I'll show you a slide by Stirling later. And this just has a screw thread, so you put in your block of tissue or your embedded block. Before they had embedding, they used to stick pieces of some soft material in there to hold it up and then cut it with a straight razor just like you would use for shaving. And this is a sliding microtome. The knife isn't on it. This is a Bosch and Loam uh, from 1885 where this screw controls the sample block and then the microtome knife slides. We still have sliding microtomes. They're used particularly for cutting large sections or things like bone. The rotary microtome is 
were invented in the late 1880s. This is a Pennock or Pencock microtome, very rare one. Uh, there's also a Pfeiffer from Johns Hopkins. The Pencock and Pfeiffer never went anywhere. Uh, they made a few of them, but that's all. Uh, Minot designed one in the United States that we still use. The stand, if you buy a microtome from Leica or someone else now, although the traditional ones were always American Optical and Spencer, which is now part of Leica, uh, that's the kind we use now. And with a good rotary microtome and a well-embedded tissue at the moment, you can cut sections of 10 microns and better. If you want to go thinner than that, you have to use plastic embedding and a little different kind of system. Okay, fixation. Early fixatives, alcohol, acid, heat, chromic acid. They tended not to be well fixed, so the specimens decompose over time. So sometimes you'll get, uh, I would buy a set of 100 or 200 slides, and most of them would be no good. You couldn't recognize anything in them. Formaldehyde didn't become commercially available until 1889. Uh, and actually, it was made for use in the dye industry at that time. Uh, Ferdinand Bloom found between 1889 and 1893 that you could use it to fix tissue and he published his method and this was rapidly accepted and within a year or two pe people were using it all over uh, the western world and of course we still use it today uh, by that time histopathology had become uh, standard practice and here's an English pathologist microscope this one's by James Swift, also in the collection here. And here's an American physician's microscope, the unusual one by Leopold Trauer from New York. American microscopes tended to have uh, a fine adjustment up here, uh, different types of mechanisms depending on the manufacturer. But they were getting pretty reasonable to use. You notice they have rings of stops. Some of them have condensers too. And again, they had to use either a lamp or <coughs> sunlight. Okay, frozen sections. Well, frozen section is now how many times they make a diagnosis uh, while the patient's still in the operating room, at least a preliminary one, and also to make sure that the physician is removing all of the tumor. And so it's become standard. And I mean, we, our pathologists go every day to read frozen sections in the operating room. Uh, they used to just use ice salt and then ice and alcohol or acetone, but they don't freeze very rapidly. And remember, they didn't have mechanical refrigeration uh, until significantly into the 20th century. So the first use of intraoperative frozen sections was by Louis B. Wilson. He was at St. Mary's Hospital, part of the Mayo Clinic in 1905. And he used a Spencer microtome with a carbon dioxide freezing chamber, which was actually invented not for use with human tissue, but uh, plant tissue things. But, you know, pretty quickly. And this is Dr. Wilson a little later. This is probably about a microscope from 1910 or the teens of Spencer. And this is actually his whole paper, this right side here, where he published the frozen sections in the Journal of the American Medical Association. So that's probably line for line one of the more influential uh, per volume of print. Uh, his microtome is actually at the Mayo Clinic, and I don't have a picture of it. It's this model. It just has a smooth finish, not the crinkle finish. Uh, Spencer made this microtome. This, I wouldn't be surprised if Leica still makes essentially a similar model, but they made it for most of the 20th century. And the freezing attachment here was invented by Bardeen in 1901. So uh, Wilson discovered it within a few years and figured out you could use it to freeze tissue and actually do it right outside the operating room. Again, this, these are from, I think, a 1920 Spencer catalog, which is the earliest pictures I could find, but exactly the same models. OK, we'll just look at a few slides. And these are all real 19th century slides. Okay. Uh, this is a specimen of human lung prepared by a professional 
slide maker. And these professional makers didn't just do human slides. They did plants, diatoms, rock sections, wood sections, anything that could sell. And this is from the 1870s. You notice all the black. Uh, this is either from somebody who lived in London who inhaled an awful lot of carbon or possibly a coal miner. Uh, Darty was in London, so that's probably where it is. And you can see the carbon particles. You can also see he's inflated the lung before he cut it. I mean, this is really a, a, a you know, work of art. And he still can also see, and we'll see in the higher part, next day, you can see the red cells on the capillaries. Here you can definitely see. You can. So a lot of these, these people had relatively crude tools, but they could do really good work. Uh, this is a pretty early slide. This is a cat kidney, and most of it is autolyzed underneath. And what they've done is they've injected the vasculature with a material that precipitates. And so what you're seeing is a cast of the glomerular tree. And they were very interested in the 19th century in looking at vasculature. That's mainly what a lot of what people looked at. And particularly with Virchow's interest in thromboembolism, that was. This is what a large number of slides that you get look like from the 19th century, where they've totally autolyzed. It says it was a growth from the leg. So, but again, this is because of the absence of proper fixation with formalin. Dyes are sort of limited. This is picric carmine showing stomach. You can recognize the features. And you can see it stains the nuclei. But again, these are before good fixation. Uh, this one is 1879. It's from a sheep. It says it's fixed with ammonium bichromate and then doubly stained. And I don't know what the stains are. One's probably picric carmine. But pretty good preservation, although it's too thick to see a lot of the real cellular detail. Uh, it's a sheep kidney with a logwood stain. And this must be after they had the mordant, because you can see the blue nuclei. <coughs> You know, tubules look pretty good. It's a pretty thin section for the period, too. Here's a really nice uh, carmine stain of carmine or, or, or unmordented logwood. It's very hard to tell uh, of the glomerulus. And you can see the three-dimensional structure and the capillaries. And here's one where it's been injected with Prussian blue. And you can see that filling many of the capillaries as it comes in from the afferent side. And here they've injected a red dye from one side and the Prussian blue from the venous side. And this is a slide by Sterling, the invented at microbe. Sterling was the assistant to the professor in charge of the anatomy museum and department at uh, University of Edinburgh. And he was famed for his injections of gross specimens. You know, but I just got hold of a handful of his slides that nobody seemed to recognize, because he's not in the regular book that the slide collectors use. But I found his obituary in the British Medical Journal. Uh, he, he was considered that important. And uh, and the students always loved him. He was always willing to go and help the students to, to work through the various types of specimens. But this is actually a human placenta, and it's been doubly stained from the maternal side and the fetal side, so you can see the interleaving of the circulation. Okay. Another technique was that they injected the vasculature and then ate away the tissue with either digestive enzymes or, or acid. And the most famous practitioner of this was C.W. Topping, who was a professional slide maker. And Topping corroded uh, tissue slides, uh, sell for hundreds of dollars, and I just have one. But Sterling did at least as good a job. And what you're seeing here is these are the uh, capillaries from the alveolar sacs in the lung. Okay, the oldest slide I have of human pathology, and there are very, very few. 
that you find before the late 1870s is an unstained slide of, of human muscle with trichinosis cysts. It's not as well preserved as we might like, but it's clearly easily recognizable. So this is the trichinella, the worm curled up in the cyst, and you can see the remnants of the striations of, of the muscle. Now I'm going to just show a few diseases sort of quickly. Scalatina nephritis, or Bright's disease, and probably there's nobody probably knows what that is. That's actually what we'd call that now is post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. It's an immune complex disease caused by streptococci persisting in circulation when you would get scarlet fever. Disease is virtually unknown. This, but this was a major cause of pathology before you had antibiotics. So not only do you have to worry about people that are dying from the bacterial infection, but if they partially cleared it, dying from the consequences uh, of immune reactions to some of these bacterial infections. And so this is the early form, and you can see the thickened and the starting to proliferate in the glomerulus. And then it sort of completely effaced all the nuclei in the glomerulus. And so this patient has glomerulonephritis. They would leak. Uh, they have inflammation of the glomerulus, and they probably leak protein, and, and the kidney no longer functions properly. Uh, this one still has, looks like somewhat rec decent tubules, but not completely. Here's another example in the kidney. This is what we call pyelonephritis, what they call superlative nephropathy, or bacterial infection of the kidney. Uh, we don't usually see it get this bad where it starts all over the place. This is called exudative nephropathy. It's very hard to definitively tell. This is either a nephrotic syndrome, or I think it may be, because I see casts in some of the tubules, this may be multiple myeloma, Bench-Jones protein myeloma kidney, where the protein that's synthesized by the tumor makes cast in combination with the tam hosphal protein. And these casts fill the tubules. You can see this proteinaceous material in the tubules. So it's interesting, you take these slides, and most, particularly these kidneys, uh, Dr. Hewan Lowe, who's our renal pathologist, has gone over them with me, a lot of them with me. It's interesting, they're pretty good. OK, something we wouldn't see very often here. This is tuberculosis in the kidney, and it's been injected for the glomeruli. But you can start to see the destruction of the kidney. And here's actually the, the caseous necrosis of the active granuloma from the tuberculosis in the kidney. A lot of 19th century pathology, of course, is infectious disease. Something else you wouldn't see very often, a diphtherial membrane. Uh, this is what forms in the throat, causes blockage. Uh, tertiary syphilis in the liver. You can see this is, you can recognize some liver here, but it's been effaced here almost by the uh, lymphocytic and plasmacytic lesion of the, of the syphilis. Uh, trachoma, this is caused by a chlamydia, and this one comes from Egypt, the very thickened conjunctiva, and it's the proliferation. And this is one of, even still in some countries, is a major cause of blindness. And back in the 19th century, if you came into Ellis Island or a place like this with trachoma, they'd send you back. It was common in Europe, too. Diseases that we do see, hepatitis, cirrhosis, obstructive jaundice, you can see both in the low and the high power, the pooled bile, and you can also see the damage to the liver cells uh, in some of the lesions. OK, a disease which is not infectious, they call amyloid degeneration. Uh, we call it amyloidosis. Uh, we can probably guess since this is in the kidney, that this is probably AL, which is a light chain amyloidosis, a defective immunoglobulin that precipitates in the kidney. And you can see the, it, it's in these glomeruli. And then we have some damage also in the tubular region. This is in the spleen. You can see these plaques of deposited material. It's, it's very insoluble, so you don't find much of it in the blood. And it deposits. And it makes a particular structure. And if you stain it with Congo red and you look at it with polarized light, it turns green. 
But there's another way you can see it, and this is a beautiful example of called a metachromatic stain. This is methyl violet, but an amyloid kidney, again from the 19th century. You can see the amyloid in the glomerulus, but and this is the base color of the uh, methyl violet staining the tubular region. In fact, that's better than the apple green ones that we get today. I don't know why people stop doing this, but they don't, use, they don't usually use methyl violet much in the pathology laboratory. Okay, they tried to do other kinds of things. Sometimes they did things you can't do. This is a silver stain of a nerve, and they're claiming they can recognize alcoholic neuritis. Looks like nerve fibers. I, I don't know what they recognized. Just taking what it says on the label. But they used to make medical students look at it and describe something abnormal about it. So sometimes it can be in your mind as well. Okay, a few tumors. This is from the thyroid. They called tumors, depending on what they look like grossly, as sarcoma or carcinoma. We call them, use those terms now based on the origin. It has to be mesenchymal to be a sarcoma, and it has to be <coughs> epithelial to be <coughs> a carcinoma. So this probably is not a sarcoma. It's probably a carcinoma of the thyroid. But you can recognize the spindle cells. The cells look like the spindles that you wind yarn on. And you find spindle cell tumors in lots of kinds of tissue. And here's one where they really got it wrong. They call this a sarcoma. And it's in the liver. They call it a round cell. You can see it's got a lot of small nucleated cells. Look at the high power. And this is almost surely a metastasis of a lymphoma. Uh, these cells are small lymphocytes. So. And this one they call the giant cell sarcoma. You can see the giant cells of the tibia. This is probably a sarcoma of the bone, an osteosarcoma of some kind. They didn't tend to cut the tissue sections uh, from tumors so that you had any normal tissue around. So we don't always know where they came from. So they, they just took them out of the middle of the tumor so you, you have no context sometimes. And here's one they called an adenoma carcinoma. This is an adenocarcinoma of probably the colon, but it could be the small intestine also. Very typical. We recognize that immediately uh, today. So they were pretty good. And this one they called the colloid carcinoma. And this looks like a breast tumor from its context. And you can see these areas that are very lightly stained. And so those are what they call colloid. It's sometimes also still up. We usually call that a mucinous carcinoma. And we see that today, and again, would call it the same mucinous carcinoma. You can see the connective tissue bands also in the tumor. So they were pretty good. Uh, by 1909, people had developed the staining and the sectioning so that they're pretty comparable to today. The slides are, don't necessarily keep their color perfectly over that kind of period. In fact, the ones that we have from uh, the 70s and 80s that we used to use for medical students, a lot of those are in worse condition than these. Here's a trichinellosis that's been stained. Uh, here's a kidney disease in the parenchyma, which they just call parenchyma. That is nephropathy, which is some type of end-stage renal disease, or an infection, actinomycosis in the lung. But you can see pretty much the blue and pink that we have today, although they faded a little bit. OK, I'd like to thank Dr. Colleen Hugh and Lowe for help with the uh, kidney slides and two of our residents, Dr. Gina Murray and Shane Starr, uh, for helping with the tumor slides so that I don't make any horrible mistakes. Okay. That's what I have. Be happy to answer any questions. And <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, well, my question is, were the lenses that were used for these early, mi early microscopes also made by the make makers, or were there sort of freelance or excellent lens makers that would be used for all of the manufacturers, basically? Most manufacturers uh, made lenses, or their employees made lenses. Uh, some of those lenses are actually pretty good. I think I may have put in the case downstairs, actually, a picture through one of, like, an 1856 lens on a 1960s microscope. And it works pretty well. Lenses until uh, 
Abbe in the 1880s were done pretty much by trial and error. He, he's the first one who calculated how you could actually manufacture them to design. And achromatic lenses, again, started around the 1830s, and, but they were made. A few American manufacturers did not make lenses, and their microscopes are found with lenses from other manufacturers. Until you get into uh, post-war, with the exception of a few Zeiss things pre-war, most lenses are interchangeable because in 1856, most manufacturers in uh, England and the United States developed the standard thread for objectives, although the, they ne didn't standardize eyepieces until into the 20th century. And so you can take and switch these objectives, and they'll switch with most modern ones. Some of the new, and they won't work on the new infinity corrected microscopes, but uh, you can take a microscope from 1980, and they'll all work. They'll fit on it and work generally. Uh, but when they started to develop specific coatings, then you ran into problems and specific corrections between the eyepiece and the objective where you needed to have things match from the same manufacturer. So. Anyone else? Well, I've got a question. Um, as a librarian rather than a special, than a medical professional, is anybody collecting the stuff that you say you don't see anymore with the possibility that it might come back? Um, you know, antibiotics might not uh, deal with it in the future or some exotic something else might cause that type of thing to, to, well, to come up, to come, well, the, come the, again. The most extreme case is smallpox where there are two Two archive samples, one in Russia and one at the, the CDC in Atlanta. Well, I'm thinking of the slides themselves. Oh, the slides, so yeah, there are people who collect the slides, and there are some, uh, there are some university collections of slides that, uh, although I haven't really seen them, anybody put much of them online, that there's really limited amount there. But there, there are, and there are a lot of private collections. I mean, there, I was, there's a surprising market in these things, and people know What's point? Although there seems to be less in the collector's market of human pathology slides than there are other types of things, but but there are there is some demand for them. So uh, otherwise, I'd have an awful lot more. <laughs> I have about six or seven hundred, but uh, there there are there are a lot uh, there are a lot that I have not been able to get. And people again, certain things are very highly collectible, like the topping corroded tissue slides and certain other famous ones. Uh, but, but there are a number of archives. And then a lot of these diseases, the infectious diseases, most of them were, were still common uh, up until after World War II. So, so there's a lot of material available for most of these things. Uh, and there are actually paraffin blocks. And paraffin blocks are, are really much more stable than the slides even. OK. That makes. It makes me feel, as a consumer, as a pa potential patient, that makes me feel a little happier. <laughs> well, when they actually discover new diseases, many times they'll go back and they'll look at some of these archive collections of, of blocks and see if they can actually find, like people have done that for HIV and for a number of these new emerging diseases where they've actually found uh, much earlier incidents of them than, than was known before. Um, fascinating presentation. Thank you. Uh, looking to the future, what 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 kind of innovations do you foresee occurring in pathology when it comes to slide pre preservation and 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 making them and that kind of thing? Well, actually, it's terrible now. What they do is the, the slides are automatically cover slipped by a machine which uses a plastic material, the lifetime of which is a couple of years. Uh, the archive material is all blocks, so everything has to be recut and stained if you want to do it. Uh, there's a lot of new kinds of stains and new kinds of techniques. It's also possible to take some of these archive blocks and recover DNA and other materials and to do contemporary types of molecular analysis on them. So, so that, that really is our archive, is the well-preserved uh, embedded tissue. Uh, there are some limited archives of 
frozen tissue, but of course that's dependent on the ability to not have any power failures or mechanical problems, and is, and is a little bit more difficult. But, but there are very large archives now uh, of, of paraffin embedded tissue that are available. And it's not unusual now if a patient comes in and they had a tumor a number of years ago and they think they have a metastasis for the pathologist to dig out the block and have it recut and look at it. But the current technology for the slides is, is nowhere near as good. But the other thing uh, is that we have now, and we have one in our department, a scanner which you put the slide in it and it takes an image of the entire slide which you can magnify up at the equivalent of about 400x. So you have your whole specimen at 400x digitally archived. And you can call this remotely. I can sit at my desk and call these up from this, from this archive. Now we're not doing that with all the routine, just with teaching specimens. But this is starting to go. I think Leica has about to release a system that does 384 slides and it does them at five different heights through the image. So it, even if the image isn't completely flat or is a little thick, it has the entire thing archived uh, at over 400x. And it'll do one of these about every one slide about every five minutes. So with the digital archiving, it's not only possible to have these things, but it's possible to send the, for somebody to access the whole image. If you need an expert to look at it at Johns Hopkins, you don't even have to have the slide. He can, if you tell him how, he can just connect to that Im image of the slide and look at. So, so that's where it's going. Thank you. That was a wonderful talk. I just had a question. Like, um, so, like most of the pictures you showed that were like color. So, were they like traced and uh, colored in, or because I didn't really see any? Because I would expect that a lot of the pictures would be black and white rather than. Oh, those are color. photographs that I've taken of the slide. Oh, okay. Never mind. And those are take those are taken on a Zeiss axioscope, <laughs> with uh, generally except for the ones I said were taken through an old microscope. But those were taken through a modern microscope with a digital camera. But those, those are the actual slides in the condition that they are now. Hopefully, some of them looked a little better when they were new. They weren't quite as faded. Anyone else? If not, then thank you for coming. <laughs>